taking the badge off. We're going to get comfortable. How's everybody feeling? All right, this is rule number one. This is going to have to be a family affair. So how's everybody doing? All right, this is an arts event. You should be happy. You should be, you should be warm. All right, so uh, first things first, uh, my name is Jesse Moore. I'm Associate Director of Public Engagement here at the White House. Um, so we know we've got a very diverse group here. Who, who, do you, who thinks they came from the furthest? Where'd you come from? Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles. Anybody beat that? Sacramento. Sacramento. Oregon. <laughs> All right. San Francisco. <laughs> you got any cartographers in here who can help out? Go ahead. Olympia. Olympia. Come on. I'm from Seattle, so this is, this is my people right here. Okay, so we're, we're from all over. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. We're going to have a really nice day. Um, a couple housekeeping uh, items. Um, today's event, I believe, I don't know, I believe it's being live streamed. Uh, so don't do anything too crazy uh, up in front of the camera. Do it in the back if you're going to do something crazy. Uh, so let's keep our phones on mute, even though there's not great service in here. Um, and also, when you have service, feel free to tweet. Um, at White House using the hashtags criminal justice reform and reentry matters. Okay? That's going to help the country make this a, a bigger event than just the people who are in the room. Let the country know what's going on in here. Um, goals for today uh, are broad, and you're going to hear different goals from different people. But I'll say we're looking to highlight the importance of innovation in the uh, in inmate enrichment work. We're looking to highlight the need for more attention, data tracking, and partnership in this space. And we're looking to underscore who we are as a country, okay? Um, and like I said, this is a family event. We're in a trust tree today, uh, and it's time uh, for some real talk on some of these issues, which is why you're here. So with that spirit in mind, I want you to join me in welcoming uh, our first speaker, uh, senior advisor to the president, and a driving force behind much of this work, and my boss, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to the White House. Thank you for coming far and wide on such an inclement day, but the sun is shining in here. I wanna recognize, of course, Congressman Ted Lieu and Bobby Scott, both who have been so integral to our efforts. Please stand up, both of you. Oh my goodness, and also, wait, wait, wait I, can't, oh, I can't even see you over there. Come on, stand up, stand up. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you all being here. Um, also, a special shout out uh, to Sabra Williams and Tim Robbins. Come on, you guys, stand up. And um, I shout them out because it's their third time here in about two months, focusing on the issue that we're all here to talk about. Uh, and so we appreciate your leadership and your willingness to roll up your sleeves. So I believe that the arts reflect our humanity. They show us what our culture is all about, and they console us on our darkest days. They lift us up at celebrations, whether it's weddings or birthdays or moments to be happy. They help us through troubled water, and they can inspire, and they can teach. And whether it's an iconic film, like my favorite, Shawshank Redemption, or whether, <laughs> gotta give him a shout out, but a very, a, uh, not only is it extraordinary acting and writing, but it also is a learning experience and teaches us the humanity of looking inside in the lives of the people who are incarcerated and the challenges and opportunities created by that. Um, I also think those of us who have um, gone into prisons and are teaching the arts and helping people who never knew they had a singing aptitude or, or a music, musical aptitude and maybe some of them learn they don't, but they still enjoy it together, gives them a sense of community and bonding. And I've heard stories that have come out of these experiences where they are truly transformative. And so we're here to talk about how we can use the arts in such a creative, constructive way, how it can, it can help create a sense of community, um, strengthen our culture, and teach us all about who do we want to be as a country. Criminal justice reform is a top priority for President Obama, and it is one of the shining hopes of glimmer that we see in terms of Congress working in a bipartisan basis next year to actually get something done. Uh, and that's really important, but also what's important is, is that every American understand how the current system does not work in their favor. And whether it's the $80 billion a year we spend on mass incarceration, 
whether it's the fact that we have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's incarcerated, whether it's the fact that we are tearing families apart by um, overly harsh sentences, particularly on nonviolent drug offenders, uh, whether it's our system of fees and penalties and bail that really have a disproportionate impact on people of color and the poor, um, or whether it's the fact that after you've served your time and earned a second chance, the deck is stacked against you to have a second chance, and whether it's employment discrimination or lack of jobs and lack of training, whether it's lack of substance abuse, counseling, all of the array of basket of issues that we know those who have been on that pipeline from school to prison, from sexual abuse to prison, from uh, poor communities to prison, suffer. So we have an opportunity here, and what we want to do is to shine the light on how the arts can shape, influence, and lift up and educate. So that's why you're all here. So that's a pretty good reason to be here, right? So those of you who are watching online, we welcome you. Jesse, they are. We are streaming this because we really want to be able to reach into every home, every business, every policy decision maker around our country to understand the importance of what we're talking about here today. So uh, who was whistling? I, saw, I, heard, I heard that. It was kind of good. So uh, all of the work that the president does in this area and that all of you do with us uh, would not be possible without leadership from the Justice Department. Uh, I have been joking lately, but it's quite serious. We have to, when the president took office, he said, let's put that capital J back in justice. And Eric Holder carried the baton uh, for six mighty years. And closing out that relay race, to mix all my metaphors, I suppose, um, who is absolutely committed uh, to doing everything within her power and authority as the chief lawyer, the people's lawyer, uh, is, of course, our very own Loretta Lynch. So please join me in welcoming Loretta Lynch. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, now I know it's a little bit late in the day, but I was told this was the energetic bunch. Good afternoon, everyone. There we go. There we go. You got to have energy because we got a lot of work to do. All right. Those of you who are going to be performing, and then also the work that we're going to pick up with as soon as we leave this outstanding, outstanding event. So I want to thank Valerie Jarrett for that kind introduction, but also I want to thank Valerie Jarrett for her work in this field. If she didn't go into it today, uh, but Valerie is one of those people who has visited prisons, who has visited reentry programs, and has taken the time to sit and talk with our fellow Americans who've been formerly incarcerated. So I thank her for seeing their potential and their strength also. And thanks to all of you. Thank you for coming to the White House. Thank you for the work that you did before this day, and thank you for the work that you're going to pick up and continue after we close out this outstanding event. All of you, dedicated public servants, corrections officials, leading reentry practitioners, all passionate advocates for the work that we all share. It's the work of reducing recidivism, the work of improving our reentry outcomes, and the work, frankly, of creating a stronger and a more just society for us all. I, too, want to thank Tim Robbins and Sabra Williams for their leadership in making this event possible and, in fact, making this project possible. But I also want to recognize your outstanding staff uh, of the Actors Gang Prison Project, the people who really pull this together. <laughs> and all the partners that you have made, that you've built in the, in the corrections community and beyond, for everything that you were doing every day, just to bring attention to this issue, just to shed some light on this important issue. So now, the people in this room, more than most, know that prison changes a person. It generates unique experiences. You go in thinking about you know, what you're going to return to when you get out, how, do you, how are you going to get through, all those things that you used to have, and you realize that you've become a have-not. You go in a father, a mother, a member of a family, and you realize that you've become a number. And when you come out, 
You think you're the same person, you feel the same, you look the same, you walk the same streets. But you realize that to many people who are around you, you've become a statistic and one that they don't want to have to deal with. And as you are walking around trying to reconnect, you realize that you could narrate Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. You could tell that story today. That's what you realize. Now everyone deals with these changes in their own way, of course. And the people in this room, particularly the people who are working with the Actors Gang, people that we're so privileged to have with us today, have used their experiences to fuel their creative energies. And the stories that they tell through spoken word, through song, open a rare window, not just into their own lives, although they do, it does, but into our criminal justice system and how it impacts all of us. It's a system that we've created. It's in fact the story of us. And the programs like the ones that we're gonna see today serve as a creative outlet and an innovative rehabilitation program for incarcerated individuals around the country. It's been proven that they help to foster self-esteem, empathy, positive expression. They prepare individuals to take on challenges both inside and outside prison walls. And frankly, they just produce a lot of beauty, which we need more of. Cutting edge programs like yours are a crucial part of our national effort to ensure that our criminal justice system is more effective, more efficient, and more fair not only in reentry, but in every part of our justice system. We've been looking at the criminal justice system from the beginning to the end, because we have to, because it impacts people at so many points along their lives, and at every point of impact is a point of change, from bail, to fines and fees, to policing, to the courtroom and indigent defense, from sentencing guidelines to incarceration and beyond. Now, I am tremendously proud to say that the Department of Justice is playing a leading role in that effort in a number of ways. We are continuing the work of the Smart on Crime initiative that my predecessor and your friend, Eric Holder, launched in 2013. And through Smart on Crime, we are driving criminal justice reform nationwide by supporting vulnerable communities, focusing on prevention, by decreasing the use of harsh mandatory sentences for low-level drug offenses, and by investing, investing the savings from our prison reduction in rehabilitation and re-entry programs that can reduce the likelihood of recidivism for our formerly incarcerated fellow Americans. Now, we're also offering resources like the Second Chance Act grants, which provide critical assistance to populations at risk and we're partnering with a number of other cabinet level agencies because this is the classic whole of government approach that has to be applied here. And that's why we're partnering with the Department of Education, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development to lower the federal barriers to reentry and to promote a host of promising approaches to reintegration. And in the coming weeks, I am extremely proud to announce that the Department of Justice and the Department of Labor together will establish a national clean slate clearing house to provide local jurisdictions with the assistance they need with record cleaning and expungement. This is so necessary. And frankly, it is an important corollary and a follow-up to President Obama's recent announcement that federal employers would ban the box and no longer ask job applicants about their criminal histories at the initial hiring stage. Let's let people just get their foot in the door. Let's do that. Let's do that. And let's hope that the federal initiative will be an example for our state and local partners who are also working on these important issues. Now, all the programs and initiatives that I've mentioned are vitally important, and you know that. Many of you work in them and you support them. And they recognize that rehabilitation and reentry are integral parts of our criminal justice system. Because frankly, what it means to do justice means working to find ways, not just to reduce recidivism, but to achieve the lasting and positive results for individuals returning to their communities, to guarantee for them, for all of them, the promise of America, the promise 
of equal opportunity for all. Now, the reentry efforts that I've discussed, focusing on things like jobs, literacy, education, life skills, these are vital needs and important programs. But just as we support people in their daily life, we must also nourish the inner life of those returning home. Now, the programs that I've referenced support the body. Education opens the mind. But art, art feeds the soul. All of us, our families, our communities, our country, we are all bound together by the story of who we are. We're defined by what we tell and how we tell it. And if one in four Americans are now involved with the criminal justice system in some way, then their stories are all of our stories too. And if they reflect a part of society and our justice system that may be hard to hear or that makes us uncomfortable, then those are exactly the stories that we have to bring forth, exactly the stories that we have to hear. Now, I've spent, been fortunate enough to spend a career in law enforcement and public safety, and I've seen how hard it can be for our formerly incarcerated fellow Americans to successfully transition out of the system, out of the criminal justice purview, and get their lives back on the right path. And I recognize how people who have been convicted of a crime all too often become trapped in a cycle of criminality, incarceration, and lack of opportunity. And I've seen, as I know so many of you have seen also, how this cycle affects more than just that one person, how it weakens communities, how it breaks the bonds of families, as well as derailing individual lives. And I know, just as all of you know, that we cannot afford to lose this precious human capital. We cannot afford to lose these individuals. We cannot afford to lose the people whose strength, whose resources, whose experiences are needed, to, not just to rebuild our families and to support our communities, but to strengthen our country. Now, I want all of you to know that I am not just impressed, I am so inspired by all of the work that you are doing, your creativity, your resolve. And I believe, actually no, I know that we can break this cycle. We can reconnect people with their families. We can provide our fellow Americans with the tools that they need to succeed. We can restore lives. We can do this. And we can ensure that every individual returning home from prison embarks on a new and productive and successful path forward. We can ensure, in fact, that they truly return home. So I want to thank you for letting me spend a few minutes with you. But more than that, I want to thank you, all of you, for your dedication to these efforts. Thank you for caring about those that truly might be described as the least of these. And thank you for realizing that, as my friend Brian Stevenson says, all of us, all of us are more than the worst thing that we've ever done. All of us. And thank you for coming together to let today be the day that we join together and we stand together and we say loud and clear that no one, no one is invisible in America, and not in this country. So thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait to see what you all have wrought and what you've brought to us today. So with that, thank you again and let the program begin. Not bad, huh? <laughs> We're bringing heavy hitters today. We're not playing around. Go ahead and take your places. You'll see some, some musicians move into place. And, and while they do, let me just ask the crowd real quick. Actually, before I do that, let me acknowledge a, another special guest who has joined us, uh, Senator Stabenow. Uh, everyone welcome her, please. Thank you so much for coming. Yes. Um, let me just ask real quick. Anything that, that uh, surprised you or uh, was particularly inspiring from what you just heard? Go ahead and shout it out. Heart feeds, what was that? Art, 
Art feeds the soul. Oh, from back here. No one's invisible. <laughs> You're kind of like, hey. Uh, anything else? Say that one more time. Not asking about criminal backgrounds. Ban the box. Clean slate. The criminal justice system is the story of us, for better or worse, yeah? Okay, so the next thing we're gonna we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna dim the lights a little bit. There's a guy back here named Leo, who I'm looking at between behind this kind of creepy two-way glass. What's up, Leo? Okay, uh, we're gonna dim the lights a little bit, and we're gonna we're gonna listen to some music. I won't uh, corrupt it with my voice. I will let them explain what this is. But um, this is a, an ensemble out of uh, New York uh, called Dakota. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, we are over the moon. We are so thrilled and so honored to be here. Thank you so much for having us. We are Dakota and we are joined here tonight by the lovely Sarah Elizabeth Charles on vocals. Um, today we represent over 125 songs that have been written by uh, incarcerated men in just two facilities. And we have the pleasure of bringing a few of those here to you today. Um, the first piece we're going to start with is one by Robert Pollock, which was written at Sing Sing. And Robert Pollock is not only a talented composer, as you'll hear, um, but also a really beautiful singer and guitarist. Um, this song that he wrote is for String Trio. It is called Lament. How's everyone doing? It's such an honor to be here. Um, this next piece that we're going to play for you was written uh, through the Musical Connections program at Carnegie Hall. Uh, it is called I Must Confess, and the composer of the piece is a wonderful musician and trumpet player named Dexter Nurse. Uh, the piece was also arranged for today's performance by an amazing musician named Brad Balliet, one of Dakota's own. Dexter has actually just arrived home uh, recently. Let's give a round of applause for that. <laughs> and while we were rehearsing this piece yesterday at Carnegie Hall, he was present during that. Um, but while he was at Sing Sing, this piece was written and it was inspired by his wife. So this is I Must Confess. Confess 
Yes. Um, we have one final song. Uh, it comes from Dakota's songwriting program uh, called Music for Transformation at South Carolina's Lee Correctional Institution. 30 men collaborated together to write this anthem of hope called Look at Me Now. And the lyrics of the chorus are, look at me now, I'm not who I once was. The trials in my life have come to make me strong. Look at me now. Feeling all the pain and sorrow. Seems like there's no hope for tomorrow. Seeing all the mistakes we've made, just praying and wishing for another day. For those who love us to truly understand that we've made this change to become a better man, to take responsibility with excuses no more. I had Chris, Larry, Landon, and Mr. Ambassador. So please don't judge us from the outside, for God has changed us on the inside. For we are five strong on solid ground. If you've got a camera, take a picture and look at us now. The 
trials in my life have come much too far. Look at me, look at me, look at me now. I'm not who I once was. The trials in my life have come to make me strong. Look at me now. The trials in my life have come to make me strong. Look at me Dakota. Dakota. We just heard voices come from behind the walls. Um, so you guys have the benefit of not having everybody look at you right now. I'm like getting all misty. There's a <laughs> some smoke in here, uh, some, some dust. Uh, that, was, that was pretty incredible. And, uh, I remember when this was uh, was pitched as part of the, the program, and I wasn't sure quite what to think of it. And uh, I won't say who, but the the folks who who pitched it were very passionate, and they were right. It was incredible. Um, uh, I, I, can I can I ask the, the audience for some for some emotions you're feeling right now? Well, how did that make you feel? Already crying. <laughs> for those watching at home, quote already crying. <laughs> We're, we're seven minutes in. Go ahead. Robert and Dexter are uh, participants in the program. We run at Sing Sing. So to hear their music here tonight yes. is incredible. Yeah. 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 So you know Robert and Dexter? Okay. Hudson Link? Thank you for your work. Anything else? How much more talent are we losing? Oh. How much more talent is not in this world? How much more talent are we losing? You're going to get me all emotional, guys. Don't do this to me. So we're going to do this. We're going to transition into a, uh, a discussion portion of the, uh, of the program. Um, we're going to talk to some folks uh, with valuable perspectives on, the art, on how the arts can serve to transform mindsets, lives, and communities, and to help uh, lead us in this discussion, to facilitate this discussion. We couldn't be happier to welcome back Mr. Terrence Jenkins. Uh, he basically has an office here at the White House now. Uh, I mean, so, somebody ate my chicken, uh, my chicken katsu out of the fridge, and that was you, okay. Um, so you may know him from E! News, uh, old school days, 106 in Park, Think Like a Man movie series, or a poster in your college dorm room. Uh, my college dorm room, I'll tell you the truth. Um, but I'll let you take it from here, and uh, join me in welcoming Terrence J. Pleasure. Guys, please give uh, Jesse a round of applause. He works on this program. Him and, and his team work tirelessly on this program. And, and one more time, I, I have to agree, I was misty-eyed watching Dakota as well. Please give them another round of applause. Uh, who, who else in here can play an instrument or has a talent like that? Does anybody else in here have? Okay, so, it's, it's, so I shouldn't feel bad that I'm the only one with no talent. Because uh, as I was watching them play, they just blew my mind. Now, who's, been, who's at the White House here for the first time today? Oh, wow. A lot of you guys, welcome. Uh, I know you feel like you're in an episode of Scandal. Uh, <laughs> con congratulations on making it in. Uh, you know, uh, d don't steal any napkins from the bathroom. Okay, I know you're looking at them like, can I take this? Uh, don't take it with you, leave it there. And uh, I know you're happy you got through security because security looks at you like you're not gonna get in, don't they? You just, you sure this badge is mine? Are we good? Okay, we good. So we're here, we're gonna have an amazing evening. I'm so excited to be here uh, to hear the Attorney General speak. It was truly an honor as well, she was fantastic. I'm sitting next to Tim Robbins and I, I can't wait uh, to see your speech. And just so many incredible people, such an incredible program. Let's get into these, this panel and answer some of these questions. <clears throat> uh, coming to the stage first, uh, she is the, from the National Endowment of, for the Arts. Uh, please welcome Jane Chu. Uh, 
from Dakota, Claire Bryant. We just saw her perform. Claire. Thank you, Claire. I need some lessons when you're done, okay? I want to impress some girls, so I just want to act like, I just want to know how to hold it so I know what I'm doing. Uh, uh, Vivian Nixon from the College and Community Fellowship has joined us. Vivian. Thank you so much. I think I stole your program. And then I, I do not want to mispronounce uh, your lack. Uh, Claire Schwadron from the Class Acts Arts. Thank you so much, Claire. So nice to meet you in person. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, questions prepared here, but I think I'd, I'd rather start with the question that just came uh, from the audience. And, and you can say it again. She's not even paying attention this time. But uh, the, the question, how, how many, well, phrase it again for me, how many people are we losing? How many artists are we losing? Can we just open the dialogue with that and then we'll jump into some more specific questions? Um, sure, I'll, I'm very happy to start. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm gonna try to get through this without falling apart. That's a powerful question. How many artists are we losing? Um, at College and Community Fellowship, we run a theater group for formerly incarcerated women and though we're an education program that helps women get college degrees, as executive director, I have continued this arts program for one reason, because I know that we are losing talent. One of the most devastating experiences in my life is when my mother, who was only trying to protect me, um, made me change my major from theater arts to political science. Um, <laughs> It changed the course of my life because I could not pursue my dream to be an actress. And so I'm so committed to these talented women who want to express themselves through the arts. Uh, Yoko Ono said that um, the spirit of art is our need, our desire to express the truth. And uh, these truths need to be told, these stories need to be told. And I want to know where is the reentry program? for the actors and the actresses, for the singers and the songwriters, and for the sculptors and the painters. Uh, Reentry hasn't focused on that, and I think it's something we should think about. Ms. Chu, I want to talk about the arts and their importance and how, how we support them. Could you expound on that? Well, we're so glad to be here because we so believe that the arts uh, infuse our everyday lives in so many different ways, and the m mission of the National Endowment for the Arts is to have all Americans benefit and be engaged with the arts. This especially is true when it comes to individuals and communities who ha are in uh, conditions that are so critical uh, that we can help improve. And incarceration is one of them. Uh, the National Endowment for the Arts has supported, even in just the last couple of years, about $1.5 million in grants for uh, arts in prison programs. Uh, Claire is one of them for sure. And the transformation that we're seeing is critical, not only because it's starting to recognize where those artists are that we wondered where they were missing, but it's starting to be um, recidivism is going down. An organizational culture is taking place that is more um, uh, workable. Uh, the, uh, the expression and the opportunity for any of us, especially those who are in an incarcerated situation, to be able to express their uh, sentiments, their feelings in a productive and a healthy way um, is so transformational and I know many of us have stories about that. We've seen such a difference uh, that this is really something to pay attention to, not let alone open up new skills for when they um, go back into society, uh, they have something to be able to be productive with. Ms. Chu talked about stories. Claire, can you share a story of rehabilitation through the arts? One of the many. Well, one thing that crossed my mind was um, just when you were speaking that we, we have a ceramics program out at Cheltenham Youth Facility in Prince George's County, and that's a boys facility and for a while there, there was a resistance from the staff that the boys would not want to participate in making pottery. But in fact, once they got their hands on the clay, they really love it. And there was one youth there that just sort of spoke out loud at the end of a session and said, you know, I think if I'd had clay on the outside, I wouldn't be on the inside now. 
So I do think that there is um, um, a, a loss. Uh, we see what I think is a disproportionate number of talented kids who are locked up. Most of my work is in ju juvenile facilities in the state of Maryland. I also work in uh, the county jail, Montgomery County Jail north of here. Um, and there are, there are numerous uh, stories. I was also thinking about a woman who uh, said, uh, upon hearing from the artist who did a presentation, we work with professional artists, this was at Montgomery County Jail, and the artist did a presentation on the work that she does, and, and some of her work involved uh, some very difficult moments in her life, and she showed a piece of artwork that was a rusted sock with nails sticking out of it or something, and this already had the, the inmates going, well, what is this stuff, you know? And so if she finally broke through and said, well, I've had a lot of pain in my life, and one woman said, wait, 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 you can make art about pain? And the artist said, well, yes, and she said, well, sign me up. You know, I know that. Um, and so this is what's been so uh, wonderful to see our visual artists, our performing artists, our literary artists, and for so many of you who work in the field, you know this, that once you introduce and guide somebody through a process, there is all this self-discovery, and then they in fact learn something about themselves and their ability to learn, and that they have something to express. And this, uh, what the artists do inside these locked facilities is provide a very safe, calm, non-judgmental environment in which people can share what matters to them and what's of concern to them. And so we do have inmates who come back to us and uh, one young woman just handed me a note inside her piece of artwork, I found it, that said um, that she appreciated the chance to make this box. The outside of it reflects her dark and stormy experience right now. The inside is uh, we're nicer colors, but she's still not sure where she's going. But one thing she knows is she's really angry. She's angry at herself, and she's angry at other people. And she said, most of all, though, I'm angry at myself. And that was it. But this, you know, she had been rather silent through the whole process. So I think that it gave her a chance to reflect in a safe place, in a place where she felt she'd be heard. And what this does also is that then allows the inmates to then move on to make decisions about other reentry programs and other ways that they might want to change the path they're on. Uh, Claire, tell us a little bit about the arts. I, I, just watching your performance uh, earlier, you know, it, it got all of us warm and fuzzy. How, how does the art, how do the arts play in reentry, in your opinion? Well, um, first of all, thank you for letting us share those pieces um, that are very special to us. Um, and I know that the men that we've worked with would just be blown away to know that uh, they're getting heard by so many uh, people in the, in, at the White House. And um, I would say, I just want to ask a question. How many of you have a relationship to music in your life? I want to see a show of hands. Hmm. OK, pretty much almost the entire room. And I think um, the, the question about how many artists are we losing is a really important one to think about. But what we've discovered in our work is that almost everyone has a relationship to the arts. Whether it's in there and you just don't know about it, um, our art form is music because we are musicians and so that's what we're working with um, uh, in the facilities that we work. Um, and we are not there to teach them music more than to empower their own artistic voice, which I think most artists kind of feel that's our job. Um, I mean, I, I have seen some, some beautiful transformations um, through our work. Uh, I was just at Lee last week, uh, which is down in South Carolina, my home state, Lee Correctional. And um, one of the men that we had been working with um, through our collaborative, uh, uh, our collaborative process, um, we have about 30 people working together in, a, in collaborative groups, writing songs together. He said, in front of a whole crowd of um, his peers, he said, when I became incarcerated, um, the first thing that I felt I couldn't feel was love and compassion, because it's not safe to feel those things um, in this place. And he said, after being part of this music program for the past two years, I feel like not only is it okay, but it's cool and awesome to feel and express those things that you know, make us the human beings that we are. Um, and um, that's been kind of the most beautiful thing for me uh, is to see that humanity sort of reawaken inside people. Um, 
Oh, great, great answer. Um, Jane, talk, please, if you could, talk a little bit about how your organization specifically helps the arts within correctional facilities and how we can help you. Well, certainly, uh, through the grants that we've been giving, we have an accessibility division, uh, which uh, really pays attention especially to the arts and prison grants. And we work with five federal prisons in West Virginia, uh, Yankton, South Dakota. We've got one in um, uh, New York and Texas. And so uh, those specifically give us an opportunity to really go in and uh, find out the good work that's being done. You know, at the heart of all of this, uh, all the stories, the different forms of expression, the different forms of art from theater, uh, creative writing has been very effective, uh, music of all kinds from choruses to uh, individual paintings. At every form of art that's been used within the arts and prison programs is not only a form of expression, it's a vocabulary in itself. And it often can take place for those uh, linear use of everyday conversation, those words that are just hard to find. And here is another form of expression that's been so, exp um, so transformational. The ways we can all help is to be very mindful of that and really uh, find out and appreciate that the arts are not just for some people and f uh, they belong to some people and not others. And the arts are not just stuck in a corner or uh, by themselves. They're infusing our lives in every day, and we can honor that, especially in the arts and prisons um, area. Absolutely. Uh, definitely not in the corner. Uh, if you're watching at home, please make sure to use the hashtags Reentry Matters, also criminal justice reform. Uh, make sure to add us at the White House for this informative program, uh, just on humanity and arts and, and, and reentry. Uh, Vivian, if you could give us another story of how you've seen reentry and the arts really affect someone's life. Well, you know, there's multiple ways to it impact someone's life and one of the ways is the transformative power of the arts and the healing power. But there's also another component to it that we really care about at College and Community Fellowship. Um, one of my partners, Glenn Martin, uh, who works with me in criminal justice reform, always uses the expression, nothing about us without us. And empowerment is something that we can use arts um, for. We empower women to tell their own stories, to go out into the public and through theatrical performances express the things that happen in their life that the general public may not otherwise hear about or understand. And it, it gives a message in a non-threatening way. We even use comedy uh, in order to do that. So um, let me tell you um, my own story because my my sisters who are part of the theater group with me all have their own voices and if they were here they would tell their stories but you know my story really is one where i was kind of robbed of an opportunity to do what i felt i was called on earth to do and that was to be an actress my, my mother from a very traditional african-american background was what you need to do is grow up and get a good job with good benefits and a pension do that and I'm a happy person, right? So when I enrolled in college at the age of 18 and majored in theater arts, kind of sneaking by on her back doing that, um, and came home, my first report card, which was literally back when they actually mailed report cards to your house, um, my mother opened it and saw that I was majoring in theater arts and in her shock, and she said some really cruel things to me. But sh it was, I. Listen, this was her fear about my future speaking, but it came out all wrong and it caused a lot of damage. Mm. She said to me, you're too ugly to be an actress. You're not Farrah Fawcett. This was the 70s. Mm. Um, that changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life. Words are so powerful. And after I spent three and a half years in prison and came out, I obeyed my mother and I studied nonprofit management and I got a real job, right? And I love what I do. I love running college and community fellowship and helping women earn college degrees. But the reason we also have that theater group is not because I want to transform these women. I want to let them loose on the world. 
I want to empower them to tell their stories and to change the hearts and mind of everyday people who have no idea what it's like to be a woman behind bars or to have suffered trauma in your life that caused you to make some serious mistakes. Uh, we have empowered these women and they have traveled across the country changing hearts and minds. So let's, let's remember that there's power in the arts and that everybody has the impact, the uh, possibility of impacting our public policies by telling their stories. I love that. Yeah, yeah. If your parents don't know what they're talking, my parents told me I was too skinny to play football. And what I, you know, I still feel like I would have had a future in it. It just, you know, I just, uh, never mind. Claire. Uh, t t talk about the reception. How do you feel um, that arts uh, and, and when people uh, are able to study and embrace arts when they're in the criminal uh, facilities, do you feel like they're being properly received as they come out? Do you feel like when they're able to use that and really embrace it that they're able to be more productive in society in other aspects? Well, at least in our programs through Class X Arts uh, and Project Youth Outreach, we do uh, work with professional artists who uh, are published or performing or exhibiting uh, artists and when they come into the facilities, the juvenile facilities or Montgomery County Correctional, they are uh, bringing their A-game and the inmates do respond to that. They see that they are being asked to step up and work uh, at a very high level and we think it's important to keep that bar high. So our visual arts programs are not easy by any means and they actually the inmates respond to this the youth respond to this they realize that they're being asked to do something with, that feels important so um, I will I just also want to point out that we couldn't do this without the support of the administrators in these facilities and uh, in particular I think of Robert Green who's uh, the director of correction rehabilitation for Montgomery County back uh, 11 years ago uh, he initially was very uh, hesitant to bring in a program because he didn't have any idea why this would have an impact on his inmates. He said, I have other programs I'm trying to run here. I don't really know why I need the arts. But he was forward thinking enough, and I say this shout out to all the other wardens and supervisors, to say, let's just try this. And we approached as an organization that facility as well as the others, keeping safety and security in mind as the number one criteria. We have to follow the rules. We need to know the policies. We need to work with them so that when we implement a program, we are doing it in a safe manner. So that when we bring it in and they, these uh, youth or inmates are allowed to come into our program, they feel like they have made a decision, which is a great thing for them to be able to make a choice. And that sometimes it's just to get out of their cells. And they say, I'm here because I want to be out of my cell. We don't really care why. Once they're in, they become engaged. And once they come in, they learn they're, they're going to find out how to paint, how to compose, how to plan, how to problem solve, how to, to uh, resolve conflict with each other. And they end up working as a team. And frankly, a lot of the youth and inmates we work with say, this is the first time I've worked with a group in a positive way. Or the, and this is the first time I've finished anything. So I think that it's, it actually does open the door, in particular at Montgomery County Correctional, for those inmates, very often they'll say, you know, maybe I will take that business class. Maybe I will go to get that GED. So it's a gateway to other programs. And one further thought on working in detention, unlike prisons, we don't see people as often. We can't expect that they're necessarily gonna be there. So we try to make sure that each workshop is a value, even if that's the only time we see that person. And, and in this country, 750,000 7, 750, inmates may be released by prisons or 700,000 a year, but 10 or 11 million come through the jails. And so it's really important to work with jails to try to get these reentry programs up and running. And arts can really play a valuable role in doing that. And I think the inmates definitely respond to it. Absolutely. Ms. Chu, please jump in. I wanted to add on those wonderful, that wonderful story because we've talked so much about uh, the power of expression and that's what is at the heart of all of this. But the skills that are being developed, just as Claire has been talking about, and especially on the juvenile uh, level as well. I visited a program that we fund in Salt Lake City called Spy Hop, where there are uh, uh, two secure care facilities where juveniles uh, participate in Spy Hop, which is all about digital, productions, uh, 
podcasts that they get to create on their own. So they learn the skills of writing and they learn the skills of producing and directing. And as they get out of that particular program and also uh, leave the secure care facilities, they've got skills, real job skills. So catching uh, that at the juvenile detention level as well is very, very important. Do they have to start with some sort of background in whatever they want to enter into? Like, I, I could never play the way Claire played earlier, but it, I mean, do they start programs from the scratch? So in this particular program that we visited, uh, the juveniles have to only do one thing learn how to express themselves. They'll teach the skills of writing. They'll teach, as you said, how to paint and how to do other things. Uh, those are important skills to develop the next vocabulary of how you express yourself. But they come in saying, tell us your story on this podcast. And through that, not only do they get skills, then they circle back and say, I had a productive way of being able to express what was really inside me. So this is a win-win uh, for everybody. Claire, that was when you were supposed to jump in and said I could do it. <laughs> and you were supposed to give me, I that was you your moment to it, give Terrence. me encouragement you, I that I could. I think you could. You know, I, okay, it's not that, too late. I need that love from you because I don't, <laughs> I don't feel like you looked at me like I had any potential. I, you at, I'm was sorry like, I uh, gave you that impression. I, uh, I believe in you. And not everybody. And I will say, I, I asked you all before, our, our only requirement in Decoda's projects is that you have an interest in music to be part of the project project. That's our only musical requirement. Um, you know, a lot of non-musicians enter our programs and uh, as I said before, the, it's about collaboration. They're not writing songs by themselves in solitary. Everybody's working together and um, I have one r amazing story from uh, another story from Lee, but two men, uh, Terry and Stuart. And Terry is this um, just unbelievable gifted pianist. So he already had the skills coming in. Um, he is a huge country fan, just big time country music fan. He was put in a group with Stuart, you know, this really big, beautiful guy who s ran the choir at the, uh, at the institution who hated country music. And he loved R&B music. And Terry was like, I cannot, I, I am not, I can't, I can't work with this. They were putting it, put in a group together and I was at Lee last week and Terry told the story from the stage a year later and he said, I remember that experience and it was really trying and oh my gosh, I couldn't believe it. But I am so happy that it happened because I learned so much from that experience. I learned how to share our ideas, meld things together. We had to work through our problems and collaborate. I mean, these are life skills that we all use every day, but through that musical sort of trauma um, came the most beautiful song and he said that is probably the best song that I've ever, ever written in my life and it's called Express My Love. You can hear it online on Dakota's website if you're interested. But I think the, the, the thing is is that the arts provide something that maybe um, really nothing else can provide in life. I mean, we've said it all before, and especially inside facilities. And perhaps like thinking about reentry is not thinking about the day that people are entering back into society. society. It's thinking about when they go in, what does their, what does their, you know, pr uh, their life look like? What is their process for the reentry? So I think that's one thing that we're thinking about, and I know lots of people are too. Uh, guys, please join me. Two questions or two minutes? Huh? Two questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, what's your name? Where are you from? Thank you, Molly. You're doing great work, wonderful work. Uh, how are you convincing uh, corrections officials and lawmakers that these programs are not just uh, touchy-feely, soft-on-crime, hug-a-thug kinds of programs, but actually good for public safety and good for society in general. No hug-a-thug programs, guys. What are we doing? What are we doing to stop the hug-a-thugs from happening? There are attractive pieces of the program, uh, even for those who are running and managing correctional facilities. Things like the recidivism rate. You have um, reports that show that for every four people who have been incarcerated who are released, three of them return sometime again within the first five years of their uh, earlier release. That's deplorable. Uh, to reduce the recidivism rate so dramatically, and there now is hard evidence that shows the percentages, is attractive. It's also attractive because it's cost effective. 
Um, and then the third one, besides just the management of every day, is think about the organizational cultures we all want to create in the organizations we work in. Uh, the organizational culture has actually changed, and many of the uh, guards have said that as well. Uh, that's also attractive as well. All of a sudden, we've got humans talking to humans, regardless of who is incarcerated and who is uh, being the guard. Um, that is also a manageable thing, and those types of operational pieces happen in above the uh, expression of ourselves and developing skills. Again, it's a win-win. Uh, any last question from our audience? Yes, sir. I want to throw the plug out for CCF as an alumni myself, <laughs> because when I walked out of prison after nearly 16 years, I met Vivian at a function and she forced me to go back to grad school. <laughs> and through the help of CCF, I got my MSW at Hunter College after nearly two decades. Wow. Thank you for that. Uh, and with that said, we're out of time. If you've been watching at home, thank you so much for watching. Please make sure you use, uh, you add us at the White House. Use the hashtag reentry matters, hashtag criminal justice reform, hashtag hug a thug. So make sure you uh, do that. <laughs> Um, I'd like to also thank everyone here on our panel. Thank you so much for the encouragement, the great words, for you guys for being outstanding, and for everyone here that's, that's changing their life around, that's going after their dream. We are here in the White House. It's, it's kind of crazy. Anything can happen. Whatever your dream is, it can absolutely happen, and we wish you Godspeed. Thank you so much. So good evening. My name is Roy Austin and I direct the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice and Opportunity here in the, in the White House. And um, the question was asked here about how many people had music in some way impact their lives. And a few months ago, I, I was in my office and my team told me that uh, Cindy Lauper was in the building. And I said to them, well, why wasn't I introduced to her? And they said, well, you like Cindy Lauper? And I said, of course I like Cindy Lauper. She was part of the soundtrack of my growing up. She was someone who I listened to basically every day as a, as a youngster. And there's something called The Age of Opportunity, a book called The Age of Opportunity, which talks about the fact that in those ages between, say, 14 and 18, the music that you hear at that time becomes the music of your life. And the impact and the importance of the arts in the work that we do cannot be overstated. And the impact that artists can have on public policy also cannot be overstated. Now, the question was asked, so how, many, how much talent are we wasting? Let me give you some numbers. About 50,000 young people are currently in secure detention around the country. Around three million kids are suspended or expelled from school every year. 2.2 million people are currently incarcerated in our prisons and jails. Now 600,000 of those people or a little bit more are going to be released every year from jail or prison. And then we're gonna end up for many of them lock the doors to them to opportunity. About five million people are currently on probation or parole. We have more than 70 million adults with a criminal record right now. So I can't tell you how much is wasted, but a large percentage of those numbers is wasted. And the real number is that more than any other place in the world, we waste our talent by locking it up. And we have to do better. I'd like to welcome Bobby Scott here the Congressman has done some absolutely amazing work and a lifetime of work on criminal justice before it was cool. He was working on criminal justice issues. Uh, Van Jones has also joined us and Van Jones has made the incredibly important point that if we have 2.2 million people 
incarcerated right now, wouldn't it be sweet if we could say we had one million? So cut 50 is the program that he's working on right now. And we, let's see if we can get it even lower than that. But as I said, artists have an incredible impact on us. They have an incredible impact on our lives. And two artists who are really part of the reason why this is even happening today in the White House are Tim Robbins and Sabra Williams. They came to the White House to just talk about the work that they're doing with the Actors Gang. And it was incredibly moving for all of us to hear about the, the, the awesome work that they're doing. And their visit came shortly after a visit that Claire uh, and her team from Dakota came. And there was this theme that this actually matters, that arts in corrections actually matters and actually has an impact. And as we've talked to them more and more, we realize that there are, you know, it feels good and the stories are important, but there are also numbers behind this. This helps people to succeed when they are out. But Tim Robbins, actor, director, producer, activist, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you know, most of us in this crowd know him from Shawshank, Redemption, um, Dead Man Walking. But um, I, I think the most important thing for today is the fact that he was um, the president in Austin Powers. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you invite the president to the president's house. And then Sabra Williams, Mission Impossible 3, uh, ABC series Injustice, Nick, uh, Nip Tuck. But together, what they're doing is they're telling all artists that they have a responsibility to help those who need it the most. And they're out there doing it. They don't need to be doing this. And they're out there doing it. So with that, Tim Robbins, Sabra Williams. <laughs> Hi. So happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Roy. I'm, I'm inspired and honored to be in this room with so many men and women that are committed to change in the criminal justice system. Uh, I became aware of some of the challenges we were facing in um, 1994, talking to correctional officers in Mansfield, Ohio, while we were shooting Shawshank Redemption. They, and many professionals in the criminal justice system that I've talked to since, have told me and made me well aware of what is broken and how to fix it. It is so encouraging that these voices are being heard today and that this administration has committed itself to reform and is open to new ideas on rehabilitation and reentry. In 2006, under the direction of Sabra Williams, the Actors Gang began working in the California correctional system. Our interest was to provide an arts program that could help reduce our over 60% recidivism rate in the state of California. The program was made up of volunteers for the first five years, and that's important because no one got paid. It was um, a group of actors who believe in a proactive commitment to social change. And we are currently in six prisons, and, I will, uh, and uh, we are also uh, working in reentry and uh, in juvenile detention. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about my personal experience with the program, but for now I'd like to just introduce Sabra Williams, the force behind it. So th welcome, Sabra. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much for coming today. I don't need any Christmas presents now. My Christmas is done. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the work that we do at the Actors Gang Prison Project um, centers around giving people tools to manage their emotional lives. We are not trying to make actors. We always tell our students, don't be an actor unless you love unemployment. <laughs> But we're using the incredible outcomes that theater and creative writing can provide to help people fundamentally change the trajectory of their lives and to help them take responsibility and gain emotional control. So this work is based on the 600-year tradition of the Commedia dell'arte, a form of theater that was practiced in Italy and then spread throughout Europe. This highly physical and emotional approach to theater was created by the people 
for the people and was never performed in the big opera houses. It was performed in the public squares. <clears throat> so very appropriate for our work. <laughs> As actors, we're actors, we're not therapists. We use the stock characters of the Commedia dell'arte as a safe space for our students to filter their trauma and their emotions through without having to share their own personal experience. So we work in eight and 10 week sessions. And recently, in response to a request by our Secretary of Corrections in California, and also our dear friend, the former Attorney uh, General, Eric Holder, we've created a template for expansion where we now run an intensive session of seven days, four hours a day, no break, we call it the theater of sweat. <laughs> and then we hand over the work to the inmates so they lead their own classes. So it becomes peer learning. It's incredibly challenging work, but it creates change very quickly and it's very long lasting because it taps into the existing source of creativity that every human has as potential, even if it's never been accessed before. So art, when done well, can touch a part of the psyche that nothing else can reach. It works like cognitive therapy in disguise. It can give tools to repattern behavior, and it holds up a mirror to help people look at their own lives and hold them accountable. And there's actually even a John Hopkins study that um, suggests that it can rewire the brain, exposure to the arts. So this brings me to something that is at the core of this work and its place in criminal justice reform. Data and studies. Don't go to sleep. I promise you it's not going to be boring. <laughs> so whenever we talk about our program, and I'm sure other people have this experience when we talk about programming, the first thing we, want to, we uh, get asked is, what is your recidivism rate? It's a very important question, right? Recidivism, that's all we talk about in criminal justice reform. But what does it mean? What are we actually talking about when we talk about recidivism? In many places across this country, our legislators do not even agree what recidivism is. Is it all arrests? Is it only convictions? Is it only when they go back to prison? And why is it that crossing state lines to go to a funeral, as one of our inmates did, is measured the exact same as killing somebody? It's a ding in recidivism. So we really need to start a conversation to make sure that we, ourselves, and the public know what we're talking about when we consider a number, the number one priority, the number of recidivism. The arts are held up as an efficient and cost-effective way to develop so-called soft skills. Those are the skills that employers value so much in employees. Things like communication, interpersonal skills, leadership, conflict resolution, empathy. Skills that are actually anything but soft. But soft. I call them core skills. And right, near we are, right now we are in a pioneer mode in being able to measure those skills. But there are people in this audience, in this room right now, who are developing ways to measure these assets. And the question is, how do you measure right brain activities with left brain measurements? We at the Actors Gang have 10 years of anecdotal evidence, mountains of evidence of the transformation of people's lives through this work, and also the culture of the prisons that we work in, and the effect it has on their families. But it means next to nothing beside our preliminary 10.6% recidivism number. <laughs> we are doing the work on the ground and we're seeing these transformations daily, but we really need your help to start to consider what evidence-based really means in relation to the arts and innovative programming in particular in this space. So humans created the current definition of evidence base, and humans can expand it to have a wider meaning. <laughs> How do you measure in numbers the massive increase in empathy that we see in our students? We need your help to find a way to take these leaps in human connectivity and translate them into the numbers that I know you need so that we can continue to get the support and funding and cre credibility that we need in able to be able to do this work. And so now I want to show you some non-numerical proof, <laughs> actual proof from the mouths of our students, the people who have the courage to do this difficult work. Please have a look. I'll do a tap dance if you want in a minute. Uh, 
That was great, so. Let's stop talking those inmates. <laughs> yes, this was a 15 second yes, video yes, we Jesse brought for you. He promised that he would do a dance if the video didn't work. Okay. <laughs> we could dim the lights a little bit to help yeah, people see it too. There we go. How are we doing? <laughs> uh. okay. it's a, it's while they're doing that, I'm just gonna well, I'm gonna let the inmates speak while they're getting this video. And you can cut me off at any time, please. There you go. First, was kind of nervous, didn't know a lot of people. You know, all the emotions I used to have, I never had the opportunity to express those emotions because being in prison, we don't show those type of emotions. I mean, participating in this here, I have learned how to do that. But the process turned out to be pretty smooth as the time went by, I feel more comfortable and the inner child came out. You know, go colorful, use your creativity, this is your chance to have fun. It's very, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, Extraordinary. It's making me feel extraordinary. I have anxiety, so it's forcing me to dig real deep within myself and learn to um, just stand in the discomfort and know it's going to be okay. This, to me, I love this class. It's helped me a lot. In a way, I think by having the mask on, it it helps you to be your inner self or to find your inner self because yep. without the mask. I think you're too you're too comfortable to even go deep inside. I've seen a marked change in their attitudes, how they interact with one another. You know, the inmate population as well as staff. So I think it's a it's a good thing. It's a positive thing, and it's what rehabilitation you know is about. Because I could go into that book and write whatever I feel. I don't have to worry about somebody judging me. I don't have to worry about putting on the mask again to act like I'm tough. What is it that you all gained out of the program that you didn't experience in life before? In the class you learn that the experience in life is we're all going to be mad, we're all going to be sad, we're all going to have moments of, of, of emotions. But what do you do with that emotion, you know? Sometimes the best thing to do is the exact polar opposite. It taught me to open up and not be afraid to reach out to another human being. It's been liberating. Even though we're not out, out there in the streets, I feel more free today than I have, you know, being out there in the streets. We're stuck in here behind, you know, a lot of obstacles. And when you get that little bit of support, it makes you feel like, you know what, maybe I am somebody. Maybe I can do something. Yes, and that's, that's just another 
I like to say thank you for this opportunity. Cause 39 years of being, I never seen nothing like this. It's been a blessing for me and a blessing to be to be able to do it with, and share with them, with everybody, and to share with y'all. Thank you. Thank you. So back. Prison Project congratulates on completing a 10-week workshop at the California Institute for Men, April 2nd, 2014. The hard work and commitment you have shown is a tribute to your resilience and desire to create value in your life and to have a positive effect on society. Signed, some guy called Tim Robbins. <laughs> and then there's a quote that says, a great human revolution in just a single individual will help achieve a change in the destiny of a nation that can even enable a change in the destiny of all humankind. And that's why we do what we do. I'm stronger now. Yes, I've grown. I want to come. I've been fortunate to personally witness profound transformations. I have seen hostile, withdrawn, numb men and women turn their lives around. I've seen the marginalized and discarded turn into sentient, empathetic leaders with an eye to a hopeful future. I've witnessed racial barriers dissolve. I've seen former enemies creating bonds that far outweigh their previous gang affiliations. Through their work in these classes, these men and women come to understand that they are the masters of their emotions and that they have a choice in how they project themselves and responsibility for the emotional choices that they make in their lives. In the third week of the program, we introduced the concept of makeup. And believe me, that's, that's a difficult thing for some of these men and women. Uh, but here's what happens. They, they, they paint their mask in the, in the character of the, the, the Commedia dell'arte that they choose. And many tell us that until they put that makeup on, they hadn't realized that they had been wearing a mask for years on the prison yard a mask of hostility and aggression, and that that mask was not who they really were. They discover in these classes that legitimacy of who they were before they made the mistakes that led them there, and they rediscover themselves. I've seen it change the entire culture of a prison. One group we worked with, we came to the end of, of an of a eight-week program, and we said to them, we're going to another prison for a while, and we won't be back for six months. And two months later, we get a, a, a message from inside the prison. And the guys that we had taught had formed their own theater company. <laughs> and they trained 40 new guys in this method, and they had written a play, and they wanted us to come see it. And <laughs> <laughs> and we had the absolute joy of watching that play, and it was so in inspiring. And we have all this anecdotal, um, uh, beautiful stories to tell. One guy told me, after being in the program for six weeks, came up to me before class, and he says, you know, there's this uh, correctional officer who is uh, pretty abusive to us. He, you know, he says mean things. He puts us in the dorms early. He takes us out late. He, he, he's, he, we, you know, he's just not a, not particularly nice to us. And he said, you know, I, after doing this work, I, I was looking at him the other day, and and I, I looked in his eyes, and I saw that there was a sadness in his eyes, and I started thinking what's going on with him at home? What is his life like that it manifests in this sadness and this hostility towards us? 
And there you have the absolute empathy of someone to have empathy for someone that is abusing them or, or being hostile towards them. And when I heard that, I realized, oh my God, we, this thing works and we got to expand it. And so we've been working on expansion for many years now. And we're, uh, as I said before, we're in currently in six uh, uh, prisons in, in, in um, the state of California. And we've gotten some recent data in. Um, our arts programs have, according to recent studies, uh, resulted in an 89% reduction in 115s. Now, those are in prison disciplinary infractions. 89% uh, in re reduction in these infractions for people that have been through our program. And a preliminary study by CDCR suggests that there is a 10.6 recidivism rate for people that have been through this arts program. That's compared to a 61% recidivism rate in the state of California. I was on a panel yesterday with two other arts organizations that were also claiming a 10% recidivism rate for the people that have been through their program. Something about the arts is working, and we've got to acknowledge that. And I'm here today to encourage the people that are leading us forward in this reform to see the legitimacy and importance of arts programming in correctional facilities. They've proven again and again to be effective in rehabilitation. If I were here, if I were to tell you here that I had just discovered a drug that results in 10% recidivism and an 89% reduction in infractions, how fast would that go through the legislature? And how quickly would that drug become available for our use? Well, I'm here to tell you that it, it is here, <laughs> and it's the arts. But it involves thinking outside of the box. We have to get over this notion that the arts are superfluous, some kind of luxury we fund when and if we can afford it. The arts are essential and fundamental. That applies for rehabilitation, and that applies for the education of our children. I'm sure that most people in this room would not be surprised to hear that most of the men and women we work with in prison had no arts programming in their middle schools and their high schools. There is a direct connection. We at the Actors Gang have seen in the eight public schools that we work in, in the Los Angeles area, and with affiliates, organizations we support, like Get Lit, which we, you'll hear from a little bit, we have seen the transformative effect that the arts have on young minds. I urge you to think of your inclusion of the arts as a fundamental necessity, not an add-on or an extra. We are a better nation than what our statistics on incarceration suggest. We are a nation of compassion and second chances. Given the opportunity, we can create a better system that views the incarcerated not as cast-offs or the discarded, but as individuals that matter, that have made mistakes and deserve a chance to change, to rehabilitate. 95% of the people in our correctional facilities are getting out at some point and they will be living in our neighborhoods. The question is simple. Do we want them leaving prison with bitterness and hostility, or do we want them leaving prison with better tools and better knowledge and advanced empathy than when they enter? The people in this room are clear on the answer to that question. So now comes the hard work in overcoming the obstacles to create and expand effective and groundbreaking programs that make our society safer, that result in a reduction in the astronomical amount of money we are spending on incarceration in this country. I'd like to congratulate all of those in this room for the good work that they are doing and I would like to just 
suggest that we allow ourselves to think creatively in how we solve the problems we face. And that together we can create a safer, more humane, and economically efficient criminal justice system. It's an inspiration to be here with all of you. And thank you for all of your great work and for doing what you're doing. God bless. This one working? You hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Tim. And uh, I'll, let me let me say uh, first of all, um, uh, Tim and Sabra uh, took me to jail. They took me to prison. Um, <laughs> something they say a lot. We're going to prison today. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, they took me to prison, and there are a couple of things that are, that are notable about that experience, uh, as you can imagine. One of them is when you're walking through a prison with six foot five uh, Tim Robbins, <laughs> you're going to get noticed, and you're going to hear uh, some people yelling from the yard sometimes, Andy Dufresne, <laughs> get me out of here, man. <laughs> I need a tunnel. Uh, so you hear a little bit of that, but you also hear, uh, some incredible things. It was, it, was a, uh, it was a day I'll never forget. Uh, you saw a lot of it. I saw some familiar faces on that video, actually. Um, so I'll, uh, what, I'll say, what I'll say is uh, they also did meditation. They did writing. They did other things, which, to be honest, I started to think I might need to incorporate into my days around here. Um, and, uh, you know, I heard, I heard a, a guy come up and talk to me afterwards, and uh, and tell me that he, since he started taking the, the class, he started, that he felt freer than he did on the outside in that class, which uh, was a jarring thing to hear and uh, heartbreaking and inspiring at the exact same time. Um, so I think, I think something I heard in the last panel, which really got me thinking as Tim was talking, was we talk a lot about uh, the negative gateways that our young people uh, especially our young people face negative gateways, gateway drugs, gateway um, everything. We don't talk enough about uh, some positive gateways. And, you know, the arts aren't just the arts. The arts can be a gateway to so much more. Uh, the arts can be a gateway to, to education and, uh, you know, a, a stronger uh, performance as a, as, a, as a father or as a, as a mother or as just a member of your community. So uh, the part of the reason I was so excited about this event is because we're putting the arts in, the, in a broader context, aren't we? We're putting the arts in a broader context uh, as to how it relates to the rest of life. So uh, it's a powerful thing. Um, so let me do this. We're actually going to switch around the uh, uh, we're going to switch around the um, agenda a little tiny bit, and we're going to go to uh, some poets that are in the in the audience with us today. Um, we ready? Okay, make sure we're ready. So uh, right now, if we could, Leo, you want to hit us with some with some mood lighting? Come on, Leo. Yeah, Leo. <laughs> okay, Leo. All right, so right now I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming the Get Lit Poets. Let's hope they let me in for free. 
degree, I gotta get to practice in a while. Stay clear, the doors are closed and I'm looking for a seat. I go to the back because that's my habitat. It's where I feel most comfortable. No action is in the front, I feel like I'm being watched, asking what drugs I got. I mean pills, I pop to stay focused. Let's get in the poetry rehearsal is my only way out. Stay clear, the doors are closing. I just passed Skid Row, and all I see is that four-year-old who clenched my mother's hand. That rides the same damn train. Really seems like a shame, but it isn't, because I'm on my way to practice. I was blessed with a rush in my bloodline, so quitting is a joke, not an answer. And this bus line represents my drops, keep going, this city is beautiful, but, but I have to keep going. I love the people here, but we have to keep going. Like the lungs of a rehabilitated smoker, graduation is getting closer. I'm too anxious to down seven, the Hoover's the next stop. I request to me out the energy I've got. I got it, All the pills I pop, I got it, Oh my brother getting robbed. I can't go back. And now the cops are getting on, it's time for me to get off. Stay clear, the doors are opening. My past days were bad days and a lot of doors were closing. Nobody knows for me, so I had to make the change. Label myself a poet, see for college, got a few options. All black universities, less diversity. Doors are now open because I was persevering. For a kid like me, it was not likely. Now schools write me letters of congratulations. You no longer have to live in the projects, the ghetto, the slums. Congratulations. Pain in your ear, a weapon, in your journal, a gold mine. Keep driving until the night falls. Just don't fall asleep on the gold line. Stay clear. Away from the negativity. Stand up. Don't feel the peer pressure. Stand tall. Be the building your ego jumps off of. We can't give up. Say, what's the point of tomorrow if you will never get to see our sunshine? Don't get us wrong. We love what we're wrong, but we cannot see our suns die. Stay clear. The doors are open. Hello. Let's do that one more time. Let's give it up for Get Lit. Get Lit. Oh, we got to. Oh, we are. Oh, we're getting real. We're getting real. We're hip around here. If we can. I don't know if we can retype that, but Get Lit. Get Lit. They're spelling it right. We're not. All right. Welcome to the White House. Uh, uh, <laughs> apologies, America. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you, thank you, fellas. That was that was absolutely incredible, and it, you know, we think we've seen a few things uh, here today, which may be uh, first in uh, in White House history, and that that was that was one of the more emotional moments that I think a lot of us have experienced. Some of us who've been here for lots of events. Um, so, uh, I want to take us into. Uh, we've got uh, one more discussion. We're gonna we're gonna hold. Um, so I want you to have questions ready. I think this is going to focus mostly on you asking uh, questions, um, and then we'll do a little bit more uh, of the arts, and then we'll uh, we'll do a little talk out before you get out of here. And there are, and I was supposed to mention this earlier. Uh, raise your hand if you ate something before you came here. Okay, raise your hand if something's grumbling. Okay, so we we won't take too long. We will we have some uh, some sandwiches and some salad and things like that for you on the on your way out if you want. Oh man, all right. Don't don't get in front of don't get in front of them in line. That's gonna be dangerous. <laughs> what sandwiches? Um, so let me introduce our uh, our uh, moderator for this panel. Um, this is somebody who who you may you may have already seen or heard from or read uh, read about. Um, she's gonna uh, facilitate a, a discussion from people with uh, perspectives from inside the prisons. Um, so I'd like to welcome to the stage Piper Kerman, uh, activist, advocate, author, and creator of Orange is the New Black. Uh, raise your hand if you're an Orange is the New Black fan. Yeah. Okay. And also, and I, I want to give a shout out to uh, Salinas Leva. Man, oh, give, give a little bit more than that. Let him know. You might not recognize her without her chef hat from Orange is the New Black. She's the one. She runs the kitchen. She's running things. Um, yeah, she'll be like, oh, snap. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> she's good. She's like my favorite character. So I was all starstruck back there. I was like, oh, hi. Let me walk you through the. I got, I got a little for Clemp. Uh, but uh, so, uh, so let me welcome Piper to the stage, and you can introduce your panel. 
Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, thank you. Yep, we are, we are in the presence of celebrity. <laughs> All right, um, I would love to welcome up our very wonderful and distinguished panel, um, starting with Juan Peterson. Juan, I'm just going to tell you quickly about folks. Come on up, Juan. Juan is a native of this great city, Washington, D.C. Yep. Uh, Juan was sent into an adult prison when he was still a young man, 16 years old, and now he works at a local hospital. And he volunteers with a group that is here in D.C. called Free Minds Book Club and Writing Workshop. Yeah. All right. I'll let him say more about that in just a moment. I also want to call up Dan Pacholke, please. Dan is, was this year appointed as the head of, uh, as the secretary of the Washington State Department of Corrections after a long and very notable career in that Department of Corrections. Dan um, is one of the people who has helped set the standard for sustainability and environmental programs and practices in correctional facilities and has implemented that statewide. And Washington State is also the only state in the nation that I know of that has a top to bottom gender responsive uh, policy and program uh, approach to corrections. So Dan and his peers and the department from which he comes is really frankly um, one of the most forward looking in the nation and I'm so glad to see you again. <laughs> Last I wanna call up Stefan Walker. Stephen Walker is the Director of Governmental Affairs at the California Correctional Peace Officers Association, also known as the Correctional Officers Union in California. And yes, prior to CCPOA, he worked as a youth correctional officer in the California Youth Authority. He is the Vice Chair for Protect, which is a national nonprofit dedicated to protecting children. Oh, I'm sorry, the, 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 but got it. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Um, and he's also a board member for Child Abuse Prevention Center and the Foundation for Independent Voter Education. And he is also a United States Marine. All right, I am so thrilled to be up here with these gentlemen. Um, I, of course, was incarcerated in the federal system and uh, and was very fortunate to be able to write a book about my experiences. And I was very fortunate that brilliant uh, actors and writers wanted to work on adapting that and making sure, I think the thing that is so true of, I hope both the book and the show is that it not only shows those arts, you know, those fine arts, not only show the humanity of people in prison, but the thing that's so important to me is that they show that people in prison have a powerful sense of agency, right? People in prison want things and they can do things and their lives have value and meaning uh, and they're important even if they're hidden away from us. And I think that is why today's program on the arts is so very, very important to me because making art is an act of power and freedom even if you're incarcerated. And that was really brought home to me recently. I teach writing in a men's prison and a women's prison in the state of Ohio. The Ohio Department of Corrections has been so generous to allow me to come and do that for a year. And the men's prison where I work does a lot of arts programs, all kinds of things. Amazing poetry and spoken word poet, uh, work like what we were just enjoyed. Um, fine arts, painting, a whole host of different arts activities are going on there. You know, prisoners have written plays and, and done full stagings of them. Not so long ago, though, I was there and I watched a man who's incarcerated there who was trained as a ballet dancer on the outside uh, dance with three other prisoners. He had choreographed that dance and the four men performed it together. And to watch those, you know, powerful bodies support each other, spring off of each other, leap through the air, I was really reminded that the ability to make art, the, the opportunity to make art is just the powerful, powerful act of freedom and that everyone deserves it. So that's why today was so important to me and I'm so glad to be here.
Um, I want to hear from each of these fine gentlemen who have obviously very different perspectives, right? We have someone who has been incarcerated and who continues to work with, with young people who are in the throes of what is a very difficult experience. We have someone who runs a state correctional system, and of course the majority of prisoners in this country are in our state systems. And we have someone who has come up through the ranks as a correctional officer and now serves a very, very important role in, I think, the biggest correctional system in the country. Is that correct, other than the feds? Yeah, all right. So here's what I wanna know from y'all. Why are these programs of so much value? Why are arts programs in these settings, in juvenile detention centers, in state prisons, in federal prisons, though frankly I've never heard of a lot of arts programming in federal prison, why so important? And I wanted to ask you that first one. Like what's the value? Mm. Good evening, everyone. Well, to me, from being on the inside, the value of arts, it's pretty much like I could speak for myself and opinion of the other guys that I was incarcerated with. Like I was young, I was 16 years old when I was incarcerated and was facing a lot of time. And at that moment, like give up on everything. You give up on yourself, you give up on life, you give up on the outside, and you just feel like you have nothing to lose, also nothing to look forward to. So when the when art was introduced to me through the book club that I, I'm currently with, it brought a sense of passion. It brought a sense of belonging. It brought like something that I was yearning for all that time, like it's a family. It, it and it also helped me see myself somewhere. It helped me to like, how can I say this? Um, like see a future for myself, because like it 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 helped me to find who I am and who I wanted to be. And and a place like in prison. When you, not just for the inmate, but for the officer also, because the officer been there so long, he started to feel the same pressure and the same emotions and feelings as if he was that inmate. So it's like when you bring something like arts to the table and everyone captures it and like it changes a gloomy atmosphere to a more brighter one like we've seen on the, on the film. And I can personally say that I experienced that both being in, in there and then also just taking a step back and just looking at the environment as a whole, like certain guys that I know for a fact you couldn't get to do it, actually doing it, and like the way it just transformed everyone into like, I never knew arts was powerful. I never knew the power, I, I never knew the power of reading, writing, performing. I, I never really understood it, never really cared for it until I was put in a position, so. Thanks. Dan, how many facilities in Washington? 12. All right, that's a lot of facilities, that's a lot of prisons, that's a lot of people that you're responsible for, both the prisoners and also the, all the people who work for you. So why is arts programming so important in Washington and, and what are you doing there? Well, l let me build on his previous answer a little bit. So I'm, I'm gonna summarize it in two words and it, it would be hope and collaboration. So, so on, the, on the one regard, I, I would say from a hope concept is, is people that are inside, they, they want opportunity and they, and they want to be involved in different aspects, things that will improve them and, and, and improve their self. Oftentimes it's hard, I guess, for an administrator or even a government or, or for some people that are, um, still want to be tough on crime to understand that change happens in many different ways and, and people have lots of different different interest and so to a certain degree you want hope in prison and, and I think hope connects to humanity in, in the sense of how we run and how we operate and I, I think those things are important. As important or more important to me in the sense of collaboration is prisons by themselves are designed to be exclusive in nature. I mean there's big walls with, with towers, w with guns, and, and for the most part they're designed to keep people in. So, so in effect what you also do is keep everybody out. So as, as was mentioned earlier, 97% of the people are going home. They're gonna ride on a bus next to you. They're gonna, they're gonna walk in a dark parking lot next to your wife. They're gonna, they're gonna be in a shopping mall when, when you're there. So, so essentially, who do you wanna have there? And so it's important that the community collaborate and interact and, and to a certain degree make a prison more permeable so they understand it's like, I don't own the Washington prison system. I mean, it's a, it's a public institution. You should be interested in what happens there. You should be, um, I, I think, interested that something humane is happening there, and, and there's a sense of achievement and purpose, and that people can move on and 
recover and do great things. Stefan, tell us what's going on in California. Sounds like interesting things we've already learned. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 first off, I'm very happy to be here. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, it's, I have to hand it to Sabra and Tim. Um, uh, I have a friend who was a former assembly member, uh, Betsy Butler, that I've, we've maintained a relationship. And she says, Stefan, I know, you know, you, you're, you're hard on this reform and you guys are pushing and you're trying to change, but you have to see what's going on with this prison actors gang. And it's surprising, and actually Dan has alluded to it, that the walls around prison are designed to keep people in, but it also is designed to keep people out and it cuts off the communication. So even within the prison system, I didn't know the fabulous effort that was taking place around something that we've been trying to get our hands around and, and help facilitate. So I, long story short, I went and saw it, and I'll tell you, if you have yet to see this, and Sabra, I don't know, is it, is it webcast? Do you guys ever, bro, you have to see this, it will, it will literally astound you. It, 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 it will capture you within the first few minutes. And the, just the, 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 the feeling that comes across, that comes through these performances, and it will, it'll make you cry. It, it really will. Um, so I, I, that's an example, a, a, a fabulous example. Uh, but I believe there are other examples, uh, and my buddy Scott isn't here yet, but um, he runs a program called the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Uh, they're reaching out uh, in, or in the prisons to help uh, individuals that have an interest in art, that have an interest in, they're going to get out. It, we've said this multiple times, and everyone knows this. You're not going to keep everybody in prison forever. Let's take that time that we have with them and help them find themselves, help them reestablish the good that's in them and expound on it. And the arts, I believe, has a way of helping them communicate, especially young people, because unfortunately, when we're younger, we don't have the vocabulary to articulate the, the emotions and the trauma that we face in life. And the arts help you do that. Um, and, and I can ramble forever, so <laughs> I'm going to stop. Um, I'm reminded by both of your references to sort of the permeability or non-permeability of prison walls. Um, of how inaccessible some of these programs might seem to folks, you know, particularly on the outside. Um, there's a program in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, where I now live, which uh, is grounded in a community choir called the Harmony Project. It's a large choir, about 400 community members in Columbus participate, and that's everyone from some very elite people in Columbus to homeless people who participate. And they have a very interesting program at the Ohio Reformatory for Women, which is one of the facilities that I teach in. And so uh, every week, volunteers from the choir go out to the prison, and they, then women from the prison are also participating in the choir. They participate by video, sometimes by Skype, but they have the opportunity to sing with those outside volunteers. And I've talked to many of those volunteers who say, I never would have known anything about these women's lives and how much they are like me. And so there are several things that happen with that Harmony Choir project. Not only do folks from the outside get the opportunity to go in and have that kind of an artistic freedom uh, of, of singing with those women, the women who are incarcerated uh, then have an ongoing program with a children's hospice in South Africa and they sing to the children who are in hospice care in South Africa several times a week. And so they have, those women have this opportunity not only for their own creative expression via song, but also to turn that song into something for somebody else who needs it. 
not there in the next cell, but halfway across the world. And you know, I think that that's a great example of making those prison walls permeable in whatever way is possible. Um, and it's really exciting and inspiring. I want to talk a little bit, since we have people who have a lot of expertise in you know, how systems operate, whether you're locked up or whether you're doing the locking. No, I'm going to start actually with... <laughs> I'm going to start with you, Stefan, actually, and come back this way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the barriers. What makes it hard to get, if arts programs are so wonderful and have so much value, and we've heard a little bit about the impact on recidivism, that, that people who are able to participate in those programs while they're confined are much less likely to return to prison. And we've heard that it has an impact on what facilities are actually like, you know, like, the, like lowering the violence within in a prison or a jail. So if there are all these good things, what are some of the most consistent barriers to getting those programs in place? And what can we do about them? I know that obviously one of those barriers is resources. When I think about the writing program I run, I have 18 students total. They are reading over the course of the year 20 books. And we give them the books. There's no photocopying, so you know that has cost. I'm there, you know, I, there's a lot of hours put in, reading their papers, you know, doing the teaching. I have a, co I have a, a co-facilitator, you know, and he, you know, needs to be paid because his work is very valuable. So there, I realize there's a whole cost, a literal dollar figure next to an arts program providing it. There's staff time and the staff in those prisons have been incredible and it takes some of their time to make sure that we can come in and do that class. And I have so much respect for the way that they've committed themselves to the success of those programs. So what, Stefan, are some of the, the barriers that you think exist, and what's the best way to overcome those barriers? Um, I'm purely from a cor correctional officer's perspective, um, I, I, I think there's this mindset that's been <laughs> it's systemic. It's, it's been you know, it predates the name change of California Correction. We were the detention of, the Bureau of Detention. And I don't know that we've ever undertaken a subs substantive effort to change that mindset that this is a lock up facility. This is, p we're, we're closed down. Um, so it, with having that mindset, safety, security are always going to be the number one issues. And someone said it earlier, I believe it was Tim and, and Sabra, that there's this perception that art is negligible, that it's, it's, it's a passing thing, it's something of, of perishable or con you know, it doesn't have value. And in a correctional setting, if something is not a high priority of a high enough value, then it gets sh kind of shuffled down. Uh, it, it has to be a high priority with administration, with, with the administrators, and then that has to be reinforced throughout all the way down to our level. And we have to believe, my president says this all the time about reform and rehabilitation. When you make us believe that we are sincere as a society, as an entity about rehabilitation, we get paid to do a job. So when the sincerity is there, we're going to do the job. But you've got to change our, and, and bear with me, but you're gonna have to change our mindset. You're gonna have to change all the things that go into hiring correctional officers and training correctional officers. Can I take one little jump here? I offered this challenge last night and I'll offer it again today. Can any of you, save the people that were there last night, can you name any mass media production that depicts a correctional officer in a positive light. Okay, 
So with that being said, people that are applying for this job, every depiction of a correctional officer, I'll tell you, there is one. There is one. It's Reuben Hurricane Carter. That's the only one I've found. And I've, I've been doing the job 30, 31 years. <laughs> but outside of that, every depiction of a correctional officer is that we're abusive, we're susceptible to bribes, we're undereducated, we're, yeah, we're, we're that far from being on the other side of the bars as Arnold Schwarzenegger's. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but if that's the mindset that's seated in people's mind before they apply for the job, and you never do anything as the hiring authority to unseed that, what are you going to get? Who are you attracting to this job? How many people with college degrees are interested in being a correctional officer? You spend four, six, eight years to get your degree in health and human services, in psychology. What better field to apply that skill set to? Anyway, like I said, I can ramble. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, barriers. Well, I, I think one barrier is just the whole label of, of evidence-based programs or evidence-based corrections. Um, we, we went through such rigor to determine what's effective and what works, and all that's correct. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, with the science behind it. It's extremely slow. So today, I think more than anything else, it just lacks innovation. It, it lacks creativity in the sense of running other small pilots or or you know, collecting data that would determine that you know, violation rates within prisons go down quite a bit in the short run. So, so at some level, our adherence to evidence-based corrections has really boxed us out from, from seeing like what would be innovative or what would be creative or what's the next thing that's gonna be really effective because we're so grounded to our funding stream being anchored to things that are so well proven through actuarial studies that last for decades. I mean, they just go on for really long periods of time. So, so it need, we need more speed, we need more pilots, we need more innovation, and we need to track these things uh, across multiple states and the, and the Bureau of Prisons and some sh somehow share those outcomes so we can move in a direction that's just more creative and more fluid. The problem with evidence-based corrections is it's just too slow. Change won't happen quick enough. If it took us two and a half decades to build up to mass incarceration, we can unbundle it quicker than that but, but recognize it's going to take some time, and it, it, it'll take changes to the fundamental way that we look at what do we do and how do we do it. I think that's the biggest barrier. Juan, so you have both been on the other side, and now, of course, you continue to work with Free Minds and to volunteer and to do the work with young people who are in, in, your, in your shoes. So what, what are the biggest challenges in terms of doing that work? Well... For me, one of the biggest challenges of doing that work is really exposing myself, you know, and really, like, not knowing how things are going to go once I expose myself to, like, you know, because, like, a lot of times, like, you front page, you, like, every, all eyes on you, you know? They want to, they, they want to, they hear you talking, they want to see proof. So it's, like, maintaining that attitude, like, throughout everywhere. Because, like, a lot of the kids that I do and I act with, I see on a daily basis on a train, in a store, everywhere. Like, I don't even remember half their faces, but they remember me. So it's like, no matter what goes on in my personal life, no matter, it's like kind of sort of being a celebrity, you know, like, you know, the camera's on you, so you got to make sure you got to watch what you do because you know somebody's watching. And that's exactly how it is because it's like, you can talk the talk, you can put up data, numbers say whatever you want to say but it's show and prove and that's like dealing with youth that's a big like your mother can tell you do this do that do this and she turn around and do something different you're like so why i gotta do it i'm going to do this too then you know <laughs> so it's basically like you, it's it's big on show and tell and it's like you gotta and also you gotta talk from the heart like you gotta realize to sit down and tell them what's real because kids know what's going on the youth know what's going on so you can't really 
bull jive with them. You can't really, you know, throw throw nothing over their eyes. You know, like just tell them what it is. You know, and that's basically me as a poet and bastard with free minds. That's what I try to do the most. Like I tell them the real. All right. So. <laughs> so. Hearts and minds change needed, some systemic change in evidence, ba you know, getting out faster than the sort of the existing evidence-based industrial complex. <laughs> <laughs> and that question of sort of authenticity and sh being able to show, show the real deal day in and day out, especially if you are delivering these programs, which is, I can say for myself, getting up in front of those classes sometimes, you know, you're right, people are gonna test you you know, which is a little intimidating if you're providing. So we want to open up the floor to questions. You have some folks up here who know a lot about how to get it done actually behind the walls. So yes, ma'am, in the glasses. Hi, um, I'm an artist in DC and run a program in the juvenile detention center here. And one of the things that um, we've been struck by is how much the CEOs actually <coughs> sort of need the programs that we're bringing to the youth. Yes. And are there, um, actual, sometimes we, they get involved in our workshops, but not in a formal way. Are there any programs that you're aware of that are bringing arts-based programming and training to the staff and correctional officers and facilities? That's a good question. I can tell you that my writing program, I'm gonna do a workshop for the staff in both prisons. And part of that is because the warden, particularly in the men's facility, who's a very wise man, says, you know what, staff need to feel a stake in something. They need to feel like it's not just for the men or the women, but they need to feel like they have a stake in it as well. So, you know, the, there's definitely interest in the prisons that I'm in, and they're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do like a three-day writing workshop with them. So that's my answer, but I wanna toss it over to these folks. I, I'm, and I'll say yes, um, with the Prison Actors Gang, there, there's, some interaction, and I think that Sabra has been phenomenal in getting our guys to soften up and um, are, and open their minds a little bit more. Uh, but, but we are, our organization is actually working with the California Endowment um, there's a, we just reached out to San Francisco, uh, San Francisco University. They have a grant and it's the, the entire premise is around toxic stress, uh, about trauma, uh, about being exposed to a harsh and difficult work environment and suppressing the fight or flight, um, instinct thank you <laughs> continuously and the debilitating effect it has on your body and system so the the conversations that we've been having are are exploring many many different um, uh, mechanisms to to help our officers number one realize what they're faced with on a day-to-day -day basis and the impact it has not just on them, but also the individuals they're charged with helping reform, rehabilitate, and correct, and then their families and the community as well. All right, we have a question right down here, Van. Hi, um, well first of all, it's just good to be here and to be talking about this here. Um, CCPOA is the most powerful uh, force in California politics with no peer. Yes. Um, I'm fascinated if you uh, are now seeing that this would be very good both <coughs> for the people who are locked up and for your members. Is it possible for you and this guy and this woman to go together to the legislature? You should just be asking money from foundations. The state of California should put the money <laughs> Party in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 without getting into detail, I, I, I think we have worked a little bit together. Um, not specifically on this issue, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. If it's something that's good for our members, that's the one thing you're, 
obviously going to see from us is that we're going to advocate for our members. Um, I'd like to make an offer to you, sir. Make that offer. Since we've been fighting you guys for 20 years <laughs> and, losing, <laughs> and losing most of the time, uh, if the arts can bring us together, prison officials, guards, advocates, family members, and celebrity artists, we should go to Sacramento together to get this fund. Yes. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have a handshake. Yes, absolutely. All right. Uh, yes, I'm going to go there in the back. Hey, um, Dr. Johnson with the House Judiciary Committee. Um, I'm intrigued by your statement, Piper, and it's nice to see you again. Uh, I used to be with Bennett CEO. Um, about the federal prisons and the programs not being there. I heard we have it at some, but not a lot. As we're um, developing the prison reform bill right now for the federal system, um, you know, law enforcement and correctional officers' perspective is obviously very important, particularly to our friends on the other side of the aisle. Um, what sort of work is being done by, say, you know, you, you folks who are, are seeing the benefits to maybe have that conversation with those on the national level, whether it's FOP, you know, the, the, the national organizations for correctional officers and law enforcement? So, how can, uh, how can the feds, particularly the Bureau of Prisons, finally learn from some of the innovation that gets done in the states? <laughs> it's a really good question. <laughs> well, I, I mean, some of it boils back to, you know, kind of the earlier statement that, you know, there are kind of beltways of criminal justice as you run across the country, and believe it or not, there's different flavors to that criminal justice as you move across the nation, and, and to a certain degree, it's influenced greatly by local politics. So at one level, what I would say to you is that what is promising practice, best practice, innovative practice in sentencing reform, in alternatives to incarceration, in what's most effective in parole and probation, and what's most effective in programming internal to prisons, whether it's in the state or within the federal government, it, it varies greatly across the, the nation. I mean, there is no single clearinghouse, there is no single set of expectations that say, you know, a determinate sentencing state is good, but perhaps your sentencing grids are weighted too heavy, and by the way, you don't offer a family sentencing alternative, much less a drug, a drug offender sentencing alternative. So, so at one scale, it's just consistency. It's, it's identifying what's really working out there effectively and providing some consistency across the country, and to a certain degree, breaking down those different beltways as you move across the nation, because much of it is out there today. I mean, I think there's many, many good practices out there today. You just rarely ever see them combined in one place at one time to offer a very effective system. What we know is we lock too many people up for too long, it's extremely effective, and ultimately it doesn't impact what we want it to impact, which is improve public safety as related to the universal crime code. So to a certain degree, we grapple with purpose. What is the purpose of criminal justice? What are we trying to achieve? Once again, trying to move away from retribution to something that really is about impacting public safety. And once you move to that public safety argument, sentences will go down and innovative programs will pick up because that is what works. It's what's most effective. It's not intuitive, but it's proven. Yes, we have a question here. Carol Mace. Um, it's, actually, it's, a, it's a comment and a challenge. Um, so I, I hear all the time that this, this focus on evidence-based um, practices that some people feel it is, it is inconsistent with innovation. And I'd like to clarify that and correct that and say that it is not inconsistent. What we're trying to do is that when you we want the innovation, we just want the assessment with the innovation so that we can all make sure that we're investing in things and testing things so that if you learn something or if you learn that it doesn't work, it still helps somebody else. So I want to make sure that we that we continue to create a culture and understanding that evidence base does not mean lack of creativity or innovation or experimentation. Very good. All right. All right. Sir, there in the back. Oh, and this will be our last question. Right <laughs> yes, you. Oh, the last question. You get the last question. <laughs> the pressure is on. I, actually, it's not even a question. Honestly, I, I just, I, you know, in, in these sort of panels and these sort of discussions and the conversation becomes, uh, you know, obviously about statistics, about future goals, they can, be, they, can, they can become a bit heady, they can be sort of uber professional, so forth and so on. So I really just wanted to say to Juan that I'm proud of you. 
Yeah. 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 It's what makes all the other talk necessary. It makes it all, it, it's what validates the other talk. And I want you to hear it, and I want everybody everybody to hear it. That like, we're proud of you, we need you. We as in the collective brown we, and we as in the collective whole, right? We need you. And, uh, and that's it, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you all for your attention, your kind attention, and your questions. Thank you so much, gentlemen. All right. We're going to move these chairs out of here. Go ahead and grab that, man. All right. Thank you so much to our panelists. Um, we're going we're gonna to move to uh, a portion which will be a little bit more interactive before we go out and, and get those sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> uh, so right now, oh, let me, let me make sure we get these chairs out the way real quick. One at a time. Leo, you know what I want. Yeah, Leo. <laughs> Leo's my guy. Leo, you get a sandwich after this, I'll tell you that. Um, so uh, just a just a couple more bullets that we're gonna get uh, get before we get out of here, and one of them I think you're really gonna enjoy. This is her sophomore performance uh, here at the White House. Uh, a, a powerful young voice, Elizabeth Acevedo. Just feel like you need more arts in your life. Period. Yeah. After that, right? It's like, like, man, like, what am I doing every day? Yeah. So we're gonna set up a morning call where you're just gonna spit some knowledge into my ear. Um, you're all welcome to join it. Um, we're gonna bring out a couple guys uh, right now to get you uh, a little bit hype as we uh, get ready to to send you home uh, with some sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, 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 so right now we're gonna welcome um, Kwame Ansubru and Kofi Dennis.
So um, you wonder how we, you know, we take this pro a program like this into the prisons uh, or into the jail. Um, we call ourselves an anti -groma and um, we do a number of things. I bring this from um, early childhood, you know, and Kwame brings it from um, teaching college. But when we get to the prison, by courtesy of Class Arts Arts and uh, Project Youth Outreach, um, we have about 15 drums out there and each, one, each, you know, each of them has one. But it's a program where we're talking about patterns and syllables and things about positive things. In traditional Africa, you play what you say. So for example, if we say gratefulness, gratefulness, it's like a circle. It goes round and round and round. Then we're going to find this positive things. We're going to find the patterns or the syllables and share it out so everybody could have a turn to play. Now, we want you to join us. So pretend, and of course, they do it because they don't um, take the drums with them. We leave the drums locked up. So when they go back into their cells, they're tapping the syllables and the patterns on their bodies. And we want you to do this with us. So here we go. One group is going to play gratefulness. We are alternating your hands, right? Gratefulness. How many syllables? Gratefulness. <laughs> like a circle, right? So gratefulness like a circle, this is going to be on this side. So one, two, three, one, two, three, four. You're alternating that on your body parts. And on this side, Around and around and around it goes, right? So, Kwame, can you show them? Gratefulness. Okay, so gratefulness like a circle. Gratefulness like a circle. That's you. On this side, Around and around and around it goes. Around and around and around it goes. And around and around and around it goes. Around and around and around it goes. Around and around and around it goes. Around and around and around. Around and around and around it goes. Around. Gratefulness like a circle. Gratefulness like a circle. Around and around and around it goes. Around and around and around it goes. Around and around and around. Around and around and around it goes. You say, you play what you say, but you must believe what you're saying. And this is what we feed. But the point is, as we, ex you know, we teach them the basics, they can make up their own. And that's what, it, what goes on. So there are no you know, right or wrong. You make up your own, but you influence them by starting positive. And soon, they're up and dancing. And one typical one that they love so much is what we call the birthday song. And we want to share that with you. You ready? First, we need to learn the, the, the lyrics. It's basic. It's la 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 la. Okay, so call and response. La 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 Let's try it again. La 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 la
March though, got the march. I got to dance a little bit. Uh, you guys feeling a little bit better? Yeah. Work up an appetite? Okay, good. All right, so we're we're gonna close it out right now. I want to bring up uh, Sabra Williams uh, to join me. I'm handing you a mic. You know, I'm handing you a mic. I know. Trouble, scary. trouble. Uh, what we want to do uh, is, is let me put it in some context. The President of the United States is a uh, he's an organizer at heart. And he doesn't like to bring a big group of people together and get them all fired up and make them feel motivated without talking about what you're going to do next, right? Don't go home and just say, well, that was nice. And then go, <laughs> you know. What's on TV? Turn, turn, yeah, that's right, you know. Uh, let's talk about what, what next steps look like to you. Does that sound good to you? It sounds fantastic okay. to me. All right, so if you guys just want to raise your hand, let's, let's hear a couple things that you think that you might do. This is, this is New Year's resolution. Yeah, so we, it's nearly a new year. Scary. So I know everybody, a lot of people make New Year resolutions, a lot of them are about, I'm going to lose 10 pounds or I'm going to get that job. But may, we were thinking, Jesse and I were brainstorming and thinking, what if everybody here added to their New Year's resolutions one thing that you could do for criminal justice reform in 2016? And we had some ideas, like maybe make an effort to meet and talk with somebody who's been justice involved, maybe register to vote, it's going to be important. <laughs> and do research on where the candidates stand on criminal justice reform. Make a commitment to search out more than one news source would be good, America, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe, sorry, that's where my with European that, with that came British out. British accent, know, sorry. that sounds really like Sorry, and then maybe like once a month you could use social media to highlight something about criminal justice reform. So these are just ideas, but you might have a million, you will have better ones than that. I see one over here. My name is Lamont Carell. I went to prison at 16 years old, and my goal was to be notorious even while in prison. And I, out of boredom, I discovered the arts, and while in prison, I ended up writing 14 books. And I think one of the things that's missing in this conversation, because when I came home, I had to face the band, the box, and even I had to go through a whole lot to even get in, get into the White House. Mm -hmm. But I was able to use the arts and, turn, and all the things I learned in, in, in the arts and turned it into an income. So it was my entrepreneurship. So I didn't have to do ban the box. So now I travel around the country doing criminal justice, one as a, a, a poet, and I get hired to direct plays. So prison, I mean, uh, the arts isn't just playtime. That may be how the prison is seeing it. And it, but it has additional value. It's a trillion dollar industry, so people can come home and actually what they learn is behind those walls and those art programs and get out and be able to do it. I live it every day. So you're so, living your New Year's right. resolution. So, what, so now what I would I suggest is that we add the economics into the, the conversation because one of the things that I'm doing in prisons now is teaching entrepreneurship. 
I even I wrote a book called Your Artist, Your Empire, and it's a guide to teach artists and how to turn their dreams into an income. So I need to get that book. Because the arts, because <laughs> if, you, if you think about it, the arts is the only industry that of having a background even may elevate you up. So it's no band in the box in the arts, so it's open. So I just think if we add the economics to it, we can probably get the things moving a little bit more. Thank you. <laughs> Any more quick New Year's resolutions? Because the sandwiches are looming. Yeah. I'm inspired by this whole event and just just honored to be part of it, but I want to encourage all the artists in the room to maybe reach out to other artists. I, I know that we all know other artists who are interested in learning how, how can I be part of doing this type of work, getting more artists involved, staying in touch, maybe, you know, I think that we can create our own sort of wave uh, from the art side of things. So that would be my New Year's resolution. Thank you. <laughs> so just two more, two more. Oh, oh Senator oh, Stabenow has one. Okay, I want to hear this <laughs> one. Like, well, somebody right make you. notes real I, quick. I, 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 a different kind of challenge. I, I mean, uh, first of all, um, go talk to your senator, go talk to your representative. <laughs> Share with them what you have heard. The arts are not a frill. The arts have been involved in my, my life, my whole life. They are not a frill. It is about economics. It is about hope, rehabilitation, self-expression, self-awareness, all these things. Thank you to all of you. And don't watch Fox News. Oh. Oh. Live streaming, people. Live streaming. <laughs> Hi, so I'm lucky enough to work um, at Free Minds with wonderful Juan, who was on the last panel there. Um, and, you know, we're just trying to do more, I think, this year to try to get the, the positive success stories like Juan's in the hands of people who need to, to be able to connect with stories like that and be able to be empowered to tell their own. And so uh, we're trying to send a whole bunch of copies of our literary journal, which is uh, compiled. Uh, written works from our Free Minds Poet Ambassadors and the individuals who are in our program who are still incarcerated. We're trying to send out 10,000 copies of that journal to juvenile detention facilities, schools, um, and, and prisons. Um, so we have our 10,000 Journals for Hope campaign. We're working on trying to do that in this upcoming year. We're gonna do. We're gonna do. That's that's beautiful. And we're gonna do one more. And we also have some uh, sheets of paper out here where you can write something down for us to take, and we'll. I'm, I'm just making this up as I go along. I'm sorry, interns. Uh, <laughs> our interns are like, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, <laughs> but you, well, you can, you can write something down and we'll compile a list and I will send it out to the list of folks who RSVP'd for the event. Merry Christmas. Uh, um, but I, but I, but I, I'm sensing a, 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 you know, a theme here, which is uh, connecting oh, face to face and in a, in a human way with uh, people who have been just as involved. Am I right? Um, a, a theme where, and as somebody who works on these issues a lot, and I think a lot of us who've been in the administration can say this, you work on these issues a lot, and you realize, I didn't realize till I went to prison for a day where I was like, man, this is my first conversation with somebody who's really in prison, and been, really been through this, and, and it, it changes the way you feel and look at all of this. And so, you know, whether it's you connecting or maybe connecting somebody else, I think that's a theme that we're picking up. Uh, first off, very good event. I thank everybody for being here. Uh, I am a warden in a federal prison, and I would like to uh, speak to you after this about uh, how we can establish your program at uh, FCC Lompoc. Yeah. There we go. I love it. All right, so let's, let's do one more, and then we've got an exercise uh, on our way out, very short one. Uh, go ahead. I think a great opportunity is to donate to organizations that are doing the work. You got to put your money where your mouth is. Use, use your celebrity to get people fundraise. Operate off of your space to you that need space now in D.C. D.C., you get locked up. You don't have bail. You go straight to federal. And so I think the youth right here, donate to organizations that need it. Put your money where your mouth is. Everybody can donate $50 because I know your shoes are fancy. So let's do it. <laughs> What, where is, what are those? What, that's, 
Van Jones. Uh, I got to give you a little. He'll be here all week. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> words spoken by uh, question askers tonight don't uh, are not all representative of the of the White House's. Uh, I'm just saying. And they, I didn't do it. They tell I did us not, not do, do it. it. It's not supposed to be. A, we can't fundraise and things like that. But you know, or lobby. I'll say. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Um, so. With that, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually exit the stage left and uh, and turn things over for a very final exercise. You good? You good? It's you ready? Okay. Seconds. You, you need to stay there. All right, I'll stay up here. All right. I can't do it without you. Final, final exercise by Miss Abra Williams. Thank okay. you so much for coming. So before I do the exercise, I have a few thank yous. First of all, without Valerie Jarrett and Roy Austin, we would not be sitting here today. So. Can I enter? I actually have. To, I'm so stupid for not saying this. Thank you to Tim Robbins. Thank you to Sabra Williams. And also, a, a name that you have not heard today, Irene Sue, who's standing in the back. No, I'm saying it. I'm, say, I'm saying it. Irene Sue, who has been okay. killing herself go, go over this. Over now, like go, ahead. go ahead. To. Okay. Um, also, my DOJ family, Carol, Sharika, and also A.G. Lynch, who gave a beautiful speech. Thank you so much for coming. These guys have been support and partners to us for the last almost three years now. We love you deeply. Thank you. Um, former A.G. Holder, who wasn't able to come tonight, but has been one of our greatest supporters as well. Congressman Lou, who was here, he had to go because he has a real job to do. <laughs> And Congressman Scott and Senator Sab Slavenow, thank you so much for coming. Is Warden Muniz in the room? The warden? Oh, thank you so much for traveling all the way from California. He's one of our wardens in California. <laughs> the Liberty Hill Foundation. Where's Karen? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, um, Every Child Foundation. Jackie Castor, thank you. Um, most of all, thank you to the White House. Thank you to the President for having the vision to open his house to things like this and make it the people's house. Deeply grateful. But most of all, I want to thank the incredible Irene Sue, who is the, the, the event diva of the world. <laughs> thank you. And lastly, and definitely not least, the hardest working person I have ever met in my life. And we've managed not to kill each other in the last two months of organizing this. My dear friend and the man who is the engine behind all of this, that he doesn't get the credit he deserves, please thank Jesse Moore. And we're going to finish how we finish every class we do, whether it's in school or in prison or sometimes even in our theater. Uh, we're going to finish with 45 seconds of laughing. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. But it's actually been scientifically proven to release dopamine in your brain, even if it's not sincere. So if you're not feeling it, <laughs> your brain doesn't know you're not feeling it. That's what's so awesome. You still get a little like drug rush from your brain, even if it's not real. So the way we do it, first of all, everyone has to stand up. And everything that we do at the Actors Gang is connected through, through breath. So let's all take a deep breath together. And now let's take a real deep breath together. And then this is the scary bit. Close your eyes. And when you hear the sound of laughter, you're going to open your eyes and you're going to look in other people's eyes and you're going to laugh for 45 seconds and you'll know it's over when I start clapping. I may actually just walk out of the room, but no. <laughs> when you hear laughter, open your eyes. I see a lot of people with open eyes. Santa is not coming to your house. <laughs> Seriously. Close your eyes, trust, take a breath. When you hear the sound of laughter, open your eyes and laugh. Thank you so much for coming.